you know, like she said, I, I studied molecular genetics during my PhD, but I went to a very traditional um, genetics department for my PhD at the University of Georgia. So I started out my training studying fruit flies of all things. But when I got the opportunity um, to study with um, Dr. Fumi Olopate at the University of Chicago during my postdoc, that was when I was first introduced to the concept of breast cancer disparities. Now, I must say at that point, I did kind of notice people in my life, like in my community, you know, have breast cancer at a very young age. And to be honest with you, everyone that I knew who had breast cancer was relatively young. So to hear that it was a disease of old age, you know, seemed to be strange to me. And um, one of the things that I learned during my postdoc then was uh, among the disparities, right, is different types of breast cancer. And I don't think I'd ever really thought about breast cancer as different types of diseases. And so when I started to appreciate that, okay, so whether you survive breast cancer probably has a lot to do with which type you are diagnosed with, but why would that matter? And, you know, as I started learning more about it, I learned about triple negative breast cancer. And, you know, the fact that it's defined by the absence of all the markers that you need to qualify for targeted therapy is problematic in itself. So... Um, I kind of started, you know, digging deeper at the time when I was studying genomics and systems biology. And so that's just a fancy way of saying, you know, we look at all the genes simultaneously, we look at all the chromosomes, and then we study how they interact with one another, because any given cell isn't just expressing one gene, it's expressing thousands of genes. And we know that cancer is a is a disease of the genome, meaning there's a whole, you know, network of genes, if you will, that are not behaving properly. And that's what drives, you know, the tumor growth. But what is it about specifically about triple negative breast cancer that, you know, makes it so elusive to treatment? So that's sort of why I'm here. And like you, I feel like I'm in a high risk group. So I figured, you know, I better figure figure this out and find the treatment before I actually get a diagnosis and need treatment that doesn't yet exist. Yeah, yeah you're right. The life we save wow. may be our own, huh? <laughs> right. Right. Take care, Owen. I love that. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Yeah. Or my so daughter. Tanya. Cousins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But Tanya, tell us your story and then we'll start talking about how we connect all these dots about triple negative. And I'm, okay. I'm loving this. You know, when I got sick, I, I knew nothing. You know, when I Googled triple negative nine years ago, and yesterday was my ninth anniversary, guys. I'm very happy about that. But when I Googled it, it basically said you're going to die. There were maybe three websites. You know, the, you had to get the list on Google. There were like three things on it. And they all said, you know, prognosis is not good. Right. You know, very fatal. Like you're going to die. Right. And so now I'm so happy that we have this wealth of knowledge that you have, that you're bringing to the table and, and giving people the, the science and the hope. But my breastie, I love you. <laughs> the time I love you too. I love you too. And I love my Sorok, Dr. Melissa. Thank you. I pray that you, I have faith that you're going to um, find a cure that will <laughs> save and extend so many lives. But my story, long, long story. <laughs> I see y'all do that. That's all good. Okay. I already know, Dr. Mo. Dr. Mo, <laughs> one of my best friends is your Clara. So she already, you may know her. We'll talk about that later. But my, my long story <laughs> short um, is um, I lost my mother to triple negative breast cancer in 1993. I was in graduate school. My mother had two girls, my sister and I. And fast forward to... 2016, my sister Yolanda was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer. And at the time, it was so crazy. She, she didn't even tell me until like it was totally confirmed, you know, just, just how strong of a woman she was. And so she was fine. You know, she was in remission for a year and one month. Cancer came back. Um, the chemo was working and then it wasn't. Um, fortunately, she had a, an oncologist who, um, she was actually treated in Orlando, at, or it was Orlando, it's, so, it's been so many things, but 
the University of Florida's system with Orlando Regional in, in Orlando. And once that chemo stopped working and she was put on a trial, we used to go to the Moffitt Center, which of course is in Tampa. And there was a series of things that happened, but her, she actually passed May 19th, um, 2016. And she had one son Pretty and- fast. That's so fast, right? So fast. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there was, there's so many things that happened in between, but I don't want to derail our, our triple negative conversation here. But so she, um, she passed um, and I actually held her hand as she took her last breath. And that left me to raise her, her only son, her child, Jaden, who lives with me now in Miami. And my sister's husband, Eric, passed of a sudden heart attack like four years prior to her diagnosis. So my nephew is without both of his parents. So I was in Orlando. Um, I actually grew up in Orlando, um, from New Jersey, but grew up in Orlando, you know, handling my sister's affairs, moved my nephew to Miami with me. And I always have my, di uh, my mammogram like in the month of October, you know, it's in Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So it was off like a month. So I go in November and they always do the, of course, the, the extra tests because, you know, dense tissue, that whole thing. And this particular day, they were taking a little longer. And you, Ricky, I know you can relate. You're sitting there like trying to watch their expression. Like, wait a minute. But, you know, I still was alarmed because I'm like, there's no way. God, I know. Like, no, 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 no. That this is not going to be a test result that I don't want to hear. And, you know, Dr. Carrie Horse at the Midtown Women's Center said, you know what? We see something that looks like a cyst. We're not, I'm not really alarmed. But we can take a look in two weeks, or I have a slot for a biopsy today. So of course I was like, today. Hello, today. Right? Yes. I've been on this for a week or two weeks, really? <laughs> right. So I um I remember sitting in my car just praying and meditating. And I go back and I have the the um biopsy. And it was like the week before Thanksgiving. So I, it was on a Friday. So I had to wait like over the weekend before I got the results. And I'll never forget. We have a bridge here in Miami called the MacArthur Cause. I mean, I was driving across the bridge and I see the number and I'm like, okay, it's just, what is her voice going to be like? Because I'm trying to like predict what she's going to say. And as soon as I heard her voice, I knew, I'm like, oh. And in fact, she said that, you know, I had breast cancer. And when I was initially diagnosed, I was diagnosed her two positive. And of course, we don't want to get a breast cancer diagnosis, but I was actually like so happy that it was not triple negative. Because like you, Ricky, you know, the first thing you do, like when my mother was diagnosed, more when my sister, because when my mother was diagnosed, you know, the web wasn't what it is now, but it's like you look and, you know, I remember like looking to find survivors with triple negative and then you find out like their blogs or whatever are, are like five years old because unfortunately they passed. And so I, you know, my surgeon who, crazy enough, he, um, he actually passed from a rare cancer like last June, so it's just like crazy. But, you know, my tumors, you know, they said, okay, it's HER2 positive. That was the treatment plan that I was put on. I, I had like two rounds of chemo. I was gonna do the Herceptin, you know, whatever that re treatment um, regimen is. But then my oncologist, Dr. Sarah Garrido, and I thank her every time I see her, um, she, just, she just found it rather odd that both my mother and sister were diagnosed triple negative. And so she was determined to just, she said, you know, and I can, I always hear her say in it because she's Colombian. And she said, well, Tanya, I just have to be sure. And she said, you know, there is a genomic test made by this company, Agendia. And she said, you know, I want to do this test. I'm not sure if your insurance will cover it. However, Agendia is known to work really, you know, they work great with patients. And she said, I'm going to do this, these tests because I, I really just want to make sure. She does the test comes back that I'm actually, she did both the, the, let's see, the blueprint and the mammal print. And it turns out that I, in fact, was triple negative. So she quickly changed my treatment plan and put me on the red devil. <laughs> and and I, I, I thank God for her and, you know, the genomic testing that she did from Agendia. Because as we all know, I might not be here had I stayed on the HER2 treatment plan. So that's the abbreviated version of my 
triple negative smoothie. All right, we got to unpack this. So if you're just joining us, this is The Doctor is In. We're talking about genomics and genetics. And as it relates to breast cancer subtypes, we're talking about family history. We're talking about triple negative breast cancer. But some, you just said some really, really important things. One, you talked about um, knowing your receptor status and the treatment that is based on that receptor status. And, you know, even before that, you talked about your sister and you said when the chemo was no longer working, right? And so I want to ask Dr. Davis, one, what happens in cancer cells that they become resistant? Why do people's treatments stop working in the most simplest of terms that you can provide for us? Help us understand how, how cancers are operating here. Right. So, you know, cancer cells are very invasive. You know, the whole reason why you have a tumor is because they found a way to evade your host immune system. So your body is actually attuned to what belongs there, what's not supposed to be there. And typically when a cell, um, you know, stops behaving properly and sort of gets out of control, your immune system is supposed to be able to find that and get rid of it. So by the time you have a tumor that's, you know, um, visual, can, can be visualized, you know, with a mammogram, um, that means that the whole genetic program is completely unresponsive to the signals that are supposed to be in place to take care of it. So specifically with triple negative breast cancer, you know, the chemo means, I mean, first of all, chemo is a very broad term, but the premise is the same, that you know, the medicine is supposed to find and attack the cells that are growing out of control. And what happens is each one of those drugs that we call chemotherapy uh, has a specific way that it finds the cell or gets rid of the cell. And your tumor is made up of different types, okay, of, of, of cancer cells. So most triple negative breast cancer tumors are what we call heterogeneous, meaning it's not all just one type of cancer cell. There are, you know, from, from the analysis, for instance, we just did, there can be seven or eight different types of tumor cells. And the chemotherapy is only able to take care of one of those types or maybe three of those types. And so then the rest of those types of tumor cells, we don't have, we don't have the drugs for those yet. And so if they happen to take an advantage of, now all of the nutrients that they were competing against with the rest of the tumor are gone, you know, those other cells are gone and now, you know, they're just free to continue to proliferate. And so that's, that's usually what happens. So you'll start seeing the tumor regress, right? You'll start seeing chemotherapy work because the drugs are getting rid of some populations of those tumor cells. But then after all of those are gone, what's left can continue to grow and then you'll see progression start to occur again. That's a great explanation. And isn't it also um, important, I guess, for people to understand that that's why there are different types of chemotherapy combined in certain ways, because exactly. some chemos target some cycles of cell growth, like, um, like adolescence versus adulthood versus older, you know, in, in, in an easy way to understand it, the different drugs target the cells at different points in their cell cycle and in their development. Right. So right. a drug might work in the dividing phase when a cell is reproducing or a drug might work in the phase where it's not reproducing and it's mm -hmm. in that sort of relaxed and chill stage, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's why you have to get certain drugs in a certain sequence also. Yep. Well, I want all the drugs. I want, I don't <laughs> want to wait for the pieces to happen, right? We need all the drugs at one time. Like, I don't get that. Like, fix it. Why can't we fix that? Because they're too powerful and, and the drugs are too strong, you know, and, and, and they can target certain cells, the fastest growing ones, and then mm -hmm. target the next fastest growing and then target the next ones. But the other thing that you said, um, Latanya, you said that um, they tested your tumor or they tested your, your genomics and found that the tumor that you had, you really didn't have. Mm -hmm. right? That the subtype was different. Mm -hmm. And so doc, I'm going to ask you and see if you can explain that, you know, if you had to explain it to a sixth grader, how does somebody's tumor subtype change, right? We just wrapped our head around ER, PR and HER2. And now you're telling me it's not that? Right. So again, you know, that term I used previously, heterogeneous, right? So usually when you're being diagnosed with cancer, you know, they take a very small portion of it 
and then they make, you know, by they, I mean, like, you know, you have a team of people who are, you know, trying to figure out what it is. Like I said, there are different types of breast cancer. And so the team of individuals study the cells, the morphology of the cells, and of course, whether or not it's expressing ER, PR, or HER2. But when you look across the entire space of a whole tumor, that's not always true across the entire area of a tumor. But to the best of their ability, they make sort of what we call the conservative, you know, uh, diagnosis. So if I see one or two cells that maybe are HER2 positive, I'm going to call it HER2 positive because at least then we can treat you with the drugs that we know will fight the HER2 positive cells. And those cells are actually very aggressive. So even if some percentage, right, of your tumor had HER2 positivity, those would be the most proliferative ones and the ones that would become metastatic most quickly. So, you know, I, I, I don't know the specifics of your story and whether or not when they went back to do mammoprint, if they did it on the biopsy versus on the surgical resection, right? But I'm sure if we were to look at the biopsy that they originally took, there probably was some percentage that were her positive, her two positive. But when they did the mammoth print now, like I mentioned, genomics means we're looking at hundreds and thousands of genes at the same time. And so when you have more information about not just that receptor, but the thing that receptors do is regulate hundreds of genes downstream. And so the mammoth print now looks at not only whether or not that one gene, the, the, the hormone receptor is expressing, but if all of those other genes that the receptor regulates are also showing, you know, that same, you know, subtype. I'm sorry for the background. Um, All good. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'm in New York. <laughs> okay. My dog's in the bar. All right. So you're giving us so much technical information. It's like, you know, a little overwhelming. I'm sorry. Like, no, no, no. It's great. It's so great. It's so great. So, so let's just break it down a little bit. So, can I tell you how I explain it to my patients, Ricky? The sure. easiest way sure. it, are that. The receptors, I, I tell patients, they're like toll boots on, I'm from Pennsylvania, so the PA turnpike, right? And you got, you know, your, your toll boots where you have to go pay your toll. And so we look on the cancer cell for these stations, for these places to receive the signals from the bloodstream, hormonal signals like estrogen. And mm -hmm. so if your cancer cell has those toll boots on it, then you pay it the dollar, the estrogen, and then it tells new cells to grow or to proliferate. And so and some of the medicines work by blocking the estrogen, taking away your dollars so you can't mm -hmm. go through any more toll booths. But if you don't have those toll booths, you're in the easy pass lane, you're in that express lane, <laughs> and taking away your dollars is not going to be helpful because you're not using dollars. And so you need something else to, to stop your traffic from going. And the difference between those receptors and the, um, the genomics, the expression, right, the gene expression is let's say you're driving through a neighborhood, you're looking for a house and you drive down the block and you say, oh, I love this house. Look at the colonial, it's got blue shutters. Oh, look, it's a split level versus you're looking at the blueprint of how the house was made. The genomics is the blueprint. What is it telling the cell to do? What's, what's the inner machinery of it versus the outer characteristics of it? And so the, the outer characteristics said that you have blue shutters, but the inner characteristics said, if you peel that paint off, they're not blue underneath, they're actually cedar, mm -hmm. right? And so that's the difference between the genetics or, or between the, the receptors, the hormone receptors and the genomics. And so that's why those tests like mammoprint are so important to patients because sometimes you'll think you have one thing and it behaves a different way. You may only have 1% or 2% ER expression and they'll call it positive. They'll say you're yeah. ER positive. One or two of those cells lit up purple mm -hmm. and you're ER positive, but your tumor doesn't behave that way. And the right. tamoxifen may not be working and the other medicines right. may not be helpful. Yeah, because that's um, not the signal I, that's I, driving the tumor. Yeah, yes. Can I bring in, kind of bring, in, bring the, um, another idea in here? Um, and it's, that was so helpful. Thanks, Dr. Mo. That yeah, helped like that. You know, figure out the piece. Yep. Um, but so there's, Ad Council did a study a couple years ago of black women. And I'm going to read you this data. 92% of black women agree that breast health is important. Okay, everybody knows about breast cancer. It's important. 92%. 25% have recently discussed it. Okay, so we're not talking about it. But guess what? Only 17% have taken steps to understand their risk. 
So you guys are throwing a lot of information out here. And I think it, you know, it's relevant to people that are talking about it who have been sick like Latanya and I, but black women are not talking about anything about their, her stories. And they're not learning from the other women in their lives that could help them to even get us to this point, right? The other data point too is that black women very often fear sharing their diagnosis. So they have breast cancer and they don't tell anybody in their family, okay, or their community, because a lot of times they're the family breadwinner and they don't want anyone to worry about them. So they're sitting here dealing with all of this stuff that you guys are talking about, but not sharing it with anyone and putting it on the table. So, you know, I don't know how we get to people. So, because because people need to understand what you're talking about, Dr. Melissa. They need to understand what questions to ask. They need to put it on the table and be talking to the kitchen table, even when we don't have breast cancer, but we were aware of it so that people know when something happens, what they can do. I mean, Latanya, you actually had the benefit of your mom and your sister and you, it was in your face, you know, but some women have it and they don't even talk about it. So how do we get people to take advantage of this wealth of knowledge that you're studying every day and, and advancing the science, Dr. Melissa, and bring it home to, you know, I want, you know, I'm talking to my granddaughter at three years old, no more breast cancer, you know, so yeah. When do you start? How do you how do you have these conversations and start them before somebody is sick? You know, right. like how do we get people to understand the 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 importance of this? Well, That's a great question. I think that as scientists, right, we need to do a better job of just educating the community at large. You know, we stand in front of large crowds and congratulate ourselves for our discoveries, and we have paywalls on you know, the most important papers and the biggest papers, and you can't even read them, you know, and if, even if you did have access to them, there's so much technical jargon that even I need, you know, I need this acronym to be defined better, you know, it's, it's difficult. Well, if you need help, I'll never get it. <laughs> no, no, it, it's simply that, you know, as with anything around science, you know, I think that everyone is not exposed to the same amount of it. And so, you know, we start having conversations around health, you know, like a health class, for instance, you know, we may talk about anatomy and normal development, but we should probably spend a little more time on how, you know, the science behind why did we come to the conclusion that estrogen receptor or progesterone receptor or HER2 receptor were the quote receptors to target you know what is the history you know behind you know it's not really that that difficult to follow you know if you know it in a chronologically you know relevant way i believe that you know we just have to do a better job so you know for instance with my group one of the things that i've recently undertaken you know because of the climate of of um, racial disparities and racial anything, you know, race-based medicine, I've certainly taken some more prerogative, if you will, to create my own website, which is still under construct construction, but, you know, that just breaks this down in, in, in small pieces so that you understand what we're doing and what I see when I look at all of the genes and why it's important. You know, I think that once women really understand the basic level of the science, then it's more, you know, it's, it's easier to talk about. You know, there's a stigma when you think about, I think we as black women are just really strong anyway, right? We don't want anybody's pity. Right. You know, I'm not going to ask for help, but you right. know, I'll if I don't have right. to. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we, we see that same scenario in so many other, you know, areas of health, mental health, you know. Um, sure. You know, we, we don't really like to share because we don't want to put our guard down or be vulnerable, you know, but not knowing that my story could help someone else with what they're going through. You know, I think also I would say in closing that treating the whole person, you know, so making, making patients aware that I'm going to treat your tumor. I'm looking at the genes, you know, I'm trying to figure out with a precision medicine, meaning 
specifically your disease, what caused your tumor to grow, and, you know, if we have any drugs in our arsenal that are going to, you know, help you and your tumor, that's my, you know, laser focus. But there are people, you know, in the world who are here and ready to receive you to just talk, you know, and treat your spirit and your mind and, and teach you how to be mindful and push away all of the negative energy that you're feeling because ne negative energy causes stress and stress yes. causes a biological response yeah. that can impact your immune response yeah. that can actually make your treatment a little harder, you know, and we don't really understand all of the connections there. But the more we pay attention to it and the more we address it, treating the whole patient, you know, yeah, I think then it'll be a lot, a lot easier. But, you know, I would like to hear from, from Latanya, you know, how, why, why did you decide that you wanted to share your story? Like, what was it that gave you sort of the impetus to be vocal and in, in public? There, oh my goodness. Um, put me on the spot as I was sitting here sort of self-reflecting because, you know, I have my moments, which Ricky, I know you can relate to this. Um, <laughs> Sometimes it's hard, it's heavy because, you know, Rick, you know, once I decided that I wanted to, to basically use my marketing talents and my creative talents, you know, that I used to apply to corporate brands, but use them in a way that would hopefully um, inform and inspire um, others. I was like, okay, God, you know, you've given me this assignment and, you know, I'm a former athlete, so I, you know, I'm a former sprinter. So I just, I've always had that mentality, like no matter what, I'm going to win. Was raised by a single super strong woman, mother. And, you know, Rich, Ricky, like you touched on, my sister was really private with her, her cancer. My mother was, was more open, but my sister was really private. And I know I get a call, I get calls at least three times a month from survivors who are not actively, you know, involved in the breast cancer community like Ricky and I. And I have friends that want me to, you know, have conversations with a newly diagnosed woman, which I, you know, I love doing that because I understand what it what it's like. Um, but I really decided that I wanted to do this for all of the reasons that we're discussing because I think it's it's scary. Um, you've got the corporate piece where you know, it's so different now, you know, gone are the days, you know, like when like my mother and probably um, several of your parents were where companies cared, you know, now it's more, you're, you're a number. So like, God forbid a company knows that, oh my gosh, you've been diagnosed with an incurable disease. You know, most people aren't going to really want to discuss it because that may affect, you know, your position at that company which now means, okay, now you're not going to have this corporate health insurance. So there's so many things that come into play when you start thinking about that. But I really, I just know that in the black community, we're very um, prideful and very strong and very private. You know, I have, I have friends who, you know, um, their parents had breast cancer, but no one knew. And some, some of some, there are some people that I know that to this day, like people don't even know that they were diagnosed with breast cancer. So for me, it was like, okay, how do I um, approach breast cancer in a way where I'm going to help educate, um, help inform, and hopefully, you know, my number one mission is to raise money for research because I think it's just crazy. Like for the majority of my life, like we've been, you know, doing these walks and these races, which I'm all for, but we still don't have a cure. And, you know, every day, you know, it's emotionally hard because sometimes like when, I, when I'm doing these talks and these interviews, I honestly, I have to push it back and like not think about what it is that I'm talking about because my, my 15 year old nephew is actually upstairs. He's without both of his parents. And when I think about the fact that my, my first best friend, she was only 43 when she passed, 43. And I meet, I've met survivors, I have survivors that are on my podcast that were much younger. And it's just like, what is going on? And one of the things that I forgot to mention, both Dr. Mo and Dr. Melissa, I have to call you Sarah, Dr. Melissa. I have to, I have to say that. <laughs> love you, Dr. Mo. I love my Greek sister. <laughs> but I feel, one of the 
thing that really stumped me and of course stumped my oncologist was the fact that both my sister and I were tested for the BRCA gene and we both tested negatives. You know, my sister was prepared to do whatever it, you know, it meant to make sure that she didn't get a breast cancer diagnosis. I tested for it and it was especially, you know, like, you know, once we lost our mother, you know, my mother was like 51. And, and that's, that's the thing that still to this day, it's like, you know, like, what? Like Ricky, and I think you tested negative. Yeah, yeah right? I, I don't have BRCA either. I don't have BRCA either. And, you know, at first I was told, well, you have triple negative, you must have BRCA. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think, you know, that's something you can help us with too, Dr. Melissa, you know, there's a lot of us out here that don't have BRCA, but, but I really believe there's something out here for black women that we haven't identified yet, which is why we need you so much because I say it every week, black breast cancer is different. We, are, we have different bodies, we have different physiology, and we've got to focus the science on black women because we have a different disease. <laughs> you know, and even, even within triple negative, you know, we have a different disease. So I feel like there's a gene we just haven't figured out yet, and you need to go back in the lab and work it out for us. <laughs> oh, I'm close, I'm close, let me tell you. So I, um, I'm the scientific director of an international consortium and it's called the International Center for the Study of Breast Cancer Subtypes, but really we're focusing on the African diaspora. So I partner with um, a global surgical oncologist. Her name is Lisa Newman. She's the chief of breast surgery at Wall Cornell. We love her. We love yeah. her. Awesome. Yeah. 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 She changed my life. <laughs> Amazing. My buddy Vivian is there too now. Yes. Vivian P. Yep. 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 My breastie. Oh, it's yes. Breastie. Yes. Um, so, uh, I love Dr. B too. She's, she's a hoot. I, um, so what was I saying? Yeah. So we, we actually collect samples across the diaspora. And what we know is that most African Americans who live in the United States are most likely going to be descendants of the Africans that were enslaved here and brought here through the transatlantic slave trade. Now I bring that up because Part of Dr. Newman's philosophy is oncologic anthropology. And so instead of just sort of looking in our five borough New York City area or Detroit when we were there, or like 17 counties in Northeast Georgia when I was there, we take a global approach. And what we see is that in any country where, and this isn't always easy to do, let me just say that, but in any country where we can separate the population based on African ancestry, so Black Europeans, Black South Africans, um, um, African Americans in the U.S., that component of the, of the population has a higher incidence of triple negative breast cancer. Even in Africa, when we compare, for instance, patients who are in our West African sites compared to patients in our East African sites, the West African patients have a higher percentage of triple negative breast cancer. And so all of those, you know, pieces and clues where, you know, this can't just be a coincidence that everywhere we find black women, African descendants, we find higher incidence of triple negative breast cancer. But more than that, now we can even use, for instance, tests like mammoprint. And within that triple negative breast cancer status, know that there's a certain type of triple negative breast cancer that's also, you know, more prevalent among people of African descent. And so, you know, most of my studies right now are focused on not only looking at race groups by self-identified race, but measuring and quantifying genetic ancestry, and then based on the Africanness, if you will, of their genomes looking for genes in those tumors that are correlated with their African ancestry. And so we have, you know, a few hundred genes now on our list that look like they are directly associated with African ancestry within triple negative breast cancer. And so now- wow. How many did you say, 150? Yeah, I'm looking at the Venn diagram now. Wow. It's a, yeah. Actually, it looks like it's more like 375. Wow. So 375 wow. genes wow. Wow. are associated with African ancestry and triple negative breast cancer. And wow. when you look at the networks, and, and so then, you know, what are these genes? What do they do? You know, it's mm -hmm. not BRCA. Right. I'll tell you that. Right. But we do see TP53. So P53 is also a cancer gene. But interestingly, 
is activated in these tumors of people who are of African descent. So that means it's doing something different than what all these textbooks told me that P53 is supposed to be doing. And so we can even dig into that a little bit, you know, all of these molecular pathways that have been defined by studying very specific humans. You know, uh, most of the genomic studies to date only are, I don't like to use absolute, so I won't say only, but predominantly are of people of European descent. And as a matter of fact, anything if, if there were if there were African Americans included, say in genome wide association studies where they were looking across the genome for risk mutations, we would see that they removed, if you will, that variation that would have been African specific and you know to make the analysis cleaner. So systematically research has ignored the diversity. Uh, that would be specific to people of African descent. And so part of our mission is to put it back in. We target, you know, we target enrollment specifically of African, uh, people of African descent across the diaspora. So, you know, we have sites in Central America now, um, the Caribbean, you know, uh, and we, we are actually finding not only gene expression networks, but potentially mutations, even in BRCA that are very common in West Africa, but are rare in other populations. And if they were to find that mutation in your BRCA test, it will come back as a variable of unknown significance. And so part of what we do is wow. lend significance to these mutations because something that's unknown is not actionable, right? So if your doctor gets the report and it's of unknown significance, well, by way of liability, they can't really tell you that you're at, you know, increased risk. They can give you some, you know, a, a genetic counselor can talk to you more in depth about what the mutation does to the gene itself and the likelihood of it, you know, removing the BRCA function, which should be protective against, you know, getting cancer. But, you know, as a standard, yeah. we it's just true. don't know enough. Because we, know we, enough. we dare not. Wow. We dare not do a double mastectomy on a patient who has a, a BRCA one or two, a BRCA mutation added um, uh, that's a variant of uncertain significance. So right. just to help people who are watching to understand a little bit, you know, and, and this isn't the best explanation, but these genes, I tell patients, they're sort of like a ladder and each gene is its own ladder. So BRCA1, BRCA2, um, colon cancer genes, APC, whatever. And when mm -hmm. you get the genetic testing, it's designed to look at the rungs on the ladder and we check for the ones where we know where the known mistakes are. Where is the ladder broken? Not just on one side, but on both sides. If both sides are broken. Mm -hmm. That is a spot that could then be causing cancer. And we know, let's say BRCA1, one, one, two, three, four rungs from the top, if it's broken, that's the spot that causes breast cancer in those mm -hmm. people or ovarian cancer in those people. But what happens if your ladder is broken down on rung number 83? Right, exactly. Do we know what that means? And does that mean it causes cancer and that you should check your children for it and that it's a, a what we call a pathogenic or a clinically right. significant mutation? And the answer is most times it's not. But in people who for whom those tests haven't been studied, how do we even really know? Exactly. And yeah. so I, I love this. And you know what? I got to make this point for, with you, Doc, because, you know, people here, they will often say, okay, you're going, you're testing Africans, but that is not necessarily relevant to, uh, to African Americans, to black people in America who are so far removed from that genome potentially. But I, what I hear you saying is that it really is more important to begin to look at that so that we can understand the, the differences and the similarities. Is that, is that right? What would you say to those people? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I wish I could show you the data, right? I'm not necessarily in the right platform for that. But, you know, every African-American, when we measure their ancestry, I know down to the level of whether or not it's East African, West African, if it's Nigerian, Gambian, Sierra Leone, you know, and I can tell you that there is variation, right? That African-Americans, because of our history here in this country, um, you know, there is variation in where our ancestry, you know, lies. You know, there are definitely admixture from various other places, Europe, South America, South Asia, Native America. 
but there is typically at least 60% of your ancestry is African, right? So, so this, the, the slave trade was a, was, was a was a powerful mark on, on, a, on human history. The African diaspora is unlike any other human population on this planet because of it. And so we see ancestry in African Americans, for instance, at a higher rate than maybe we would see um, the ability to distinguish with, within a European family, you know, whether or not they had Italian versus Polish ancestry. And so we, we, we functionalize that information. And I'm not saying that it's an absolute, right? I'm not saying that all African Americans have the same percentage of Africanness. I'm not even saying that the same region on a chromosome, you know, is going to have, you know, African ancestry. My chromosome one could potentially all be Native American, but my chromosome 15 could be all, you know, African from Sierra Leone. My chromosome five could be from Egypt for all I know, you know? And so because of all of this mixture, it becomes that much more complex to find what might be the common thing when we look, because we, we see though, we see globally, like I just said, everywhere we go, like people of African descent have triple negative breast cancer. That cannot be coincidental. And it certainly is not all because of environmental influences. You know, the Ghanaian, the, 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 the Ghanaian environment is very different from South Side Chicago or Detroit or rural Georgia, you know. So, you know, I think we just need more information. You know, historically, we just have not been included to the extent of trying to define the diversity. We just haven't been included. And I like your analogy about the rungs on the ladder. You know, if I can, if I can borrow that and go one oh, step great. further, you know, the BRCA gene was discovered because people like Marie Claire King were studying these very large families across many, many generations. And these families had, you know, a lot of good information about their health about their diagnosis, they knew their relatedness, all the way back, like five or six generations. African Americans, maybe three, you know, <laughs> maybe three. And if you go back to that, you know, eldest generation, there's probably very little health information, you know, about, you know, like I said, I told you my grandfather died of prostate cancer, but if you look at his medical record, it says something like cancer of the bowels, right? So it's not even well annotated. But when Marie Claire King studied these families, she studied the transmission of the disease through the families. And so she showed how a mother passed it on to their daughters and onto their children, right? And then she studied what is it across their chromosomes that that match every time I see the disease occur in a family. And so she was literally tracking, you know, um, for, for borrowing, your, borrowing your, your analogy, like if the rung was painted purple, right? So everybody who had the purple rung, when I looked at their chromosomes physically, like literally, she's looking at the chromosomes in the cells. And she sees like every time, you know, the disease is transmitted, this purple rung is following it. So it must be this purple rung. And so what's on this purple rung? The BRCA gene. And then when technology allowed, we were able to sequence the BRCA gene and identify what that mutation was. And that's why to this day, and those families were Ashkenazi Jewish families. And so to this day, the most famous mutations in BRCA are the ones that are most prevalently found in the Ashkenazi Jewish population. And so if we have that same capacity to, to, tra to travel back in time and, and have our history and our, 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 our lineage intact, and we could follow the transmission of breast cancer in our families, then we may find, again, you know, more mutations that are specific to other populations, right? And that's true of, of any population, whether it's incredible. Latin American, European, East Asian, mm -hmm. South Asian, we could potentially do that in any population with the technology that we have, but we can do it even more so um, if we sequence the whole genome.
in wow. Miami. Also, I love this. Let yeah. me, let also, me blow your mind real across, quick. Also across some um, other yeah. breast cancers, because you're primarily looking at triple negative, but right. there are other breast cancers we have to even consider, you know, and it's funny because a year ago, I had the, a new gene panel done. And, you, and so when, when Dr. Regina Hampton called me and said, okay, Ricky, you don't have any mutations. I said, well, that's good, right? She's like, eh, not really, because we don't really know. You know, she's like, you know, we don't really know. We know of today, right? All this. Right. So, you know so, what? So much work to do. Go ahead, Mom. Sorry. The, the deep thing about this, and I'm, I'm going to let you jump back in here. What's going to blow everybody's minds, too, is when you think about because I, I love this stuff. We got to have you again. But mm. it's not even just the genes you were born with, right? But then which of them get turned on, turned off, how they get activated, what happened in the middle passage, which genes are That's expressed right. because the expression. Yep or the degree to which a gene will cause damage in your body is different depending on environment, depending oh. on stress, depending on, you know, lots of different yeah. things. And so that's a whole other part that's of this right. in and of itself. People who have a BRCA gene mutation may never get breast cancer, that's right? 80% right. in their lifetime or 76% may, but what happens in that other 14% that don't? Why don't their genes get turned on or off? And so as we begin to look at this, you know, we might find that our genes are being activated differently as a result right. of even just things like stress. That's right. right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. What you're exposed to, <laughs> how you crazy. live your life, where you have to live, you know, mm -hmm. um, right. all of that feeds into it. And, right. and, and speaking on like, I'm not trying to get too technical, but you know, some people who are BRCA negative, when you look at their tumors, don't have any mutations. It's because their gene was shut down because of other, you know, mechanisms. And it's called like methylation, right? And so we know that methylated DNA can prevent a gene from being expressed. And so I was just reading a paper the other day and I'm trying to figure out like, how do I tell the community that, you know, 90% of the tumors that were basal-like had a methylated BRCA, not a mutated BRCA in this study. Yeah. And that's not something they're testing for, mm -hmm. you know, when you do this mutation. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You know, and so we I have, we have so many questions in the yeah. chat. Yeah. I don't think we're going to be able to answer them all. <laughs> gotta get this so we'll, we can go back and, and do it oh, later. Good. But um, we can probably answer, answer a bunch of them later. But um, a lot of them are about, um, you know, just how do you get tested? How do you know when to get tested? Maybe we can kind of start there. And then do you have to have breast cancer to get tested? So let's, we could start there, but then I think we'll have to go back you guys and sort of answer your questions. And I'm gonna get these brilliant ladies to help us do that because I couldn't begin to answer your questions, but. That's a um, question for Dr. Uh, Gary. Yeah, I, I run the high risk program at my hospital and I started it for people like me who have family histories, but didn't have cancer yet. And we wanted to know, you know, what, uh, what was in our genome and you know if we were predisposed to getting cancers or at highest risk not just high error but highest risk and um then test those people and try to come up with preventive care plans so each patient gets a, a sort of a preventive package this is what you need here's how we're going to screen you for breast cancer for colon cancer for whatever your genes are telling us you're at highest risk for so you can get that testing through your um uh, through your physicians if you meet certain criteria. So the criteria, classic criteria by the NCCN, which is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, nccn.org is like the cancer Bible sort of the guideline for what many cancer doctors follow here in the US. And they say that if you have three or more relatives on one side of the family that have a certain type of cancer, let's say breast cancer, um, um, uh, other cancers, colon cancer, for example. If you have someone in your family who was diagnosed very young, under the age of 40, okay? Um, if you have someone with rare cancers in your family, like ovarian cancers, less than 1% of the population should get ovarian cancer. So if you meet certain criteria, your insurance should pay for you to get your genetics done, your genetic analysis done. And that can be either blood, or saliva. Um, some tests are still scope where you just switch the scope and spit back into the tube. They're called buckle and they take the cells from the inside of your mouth. But by and large, you can spit in a tube and it'll take about two to four weeks to process and they can tell you what changes you have in your genes. So if you have three or more relatives on one side of the family 
if someone was diagnosed young with breast cancer, if you were diagnosed with triple negative under the age of 60, if you had triple negative breast cancer at 55 and no doctor ever offers you genetic testing, you meet criteria. And you should talk to your breast surgeon. You can talk to your medical oncologist, the doctor who treats cancer with medicine. You can talk to your gynecologist because now these kits are going to the gynecologist offices, even primary care offices. And they're at the point now because of the coronavirus, they will send a kit to your house. If you meet criteria, you can go on the website and they will mail a kit to you. You spit in the tube, fill out some paperwork and they'll take care of the rest. So if you think you meet that criteria, go to the different websites for genetic testing, Myriad, Ambry, Invite. Um, I know there's others um, and many companies, but you Google genetic testing companies, you'll get a whole list of them. Yeah. Hey, Latanya, did you know about all this when you were sick? Like, I think that I probably was asked to get tested because I was triple negative because I didn't really have a history. But did you, did you know about all this stuff? Like, doesn't this sound like, you know, as a patient, you know, it's really hard to navigate this stuff. Like, it's, we don't even know what to ask, right? Right. So like my sister and I were tested for the BRCA gene, you know, before obviously either one of us were diagnosed. But then once I was diagnosed, like when my um, oncologist, I had no idea. I'd never heard of a gene. I didn't know what a mammal print or a blueprint was, but it just, that's yeah. why I'm looking up. <laughs> right. I was just so grateful that I had that type of oncologist that said, you know what, I'm going to treat you like family. And that's one of the, the reasons I love doing these these chats so that you know we're informing and educating but like no I had if it weren't for her like advocating for me I had no idea so now that I know I try to pass that information on because you know you have my sister used to always said you have to be your own advocate because I'm sure my oncologist like one of she's really one of the top oncologists in Miami she's highly sought after I don't even think she's taking patients anymore but she has so when she's in clinic it's like I don't even understand, like Dr. Moe and like how you guys do it, but she's so thorough and I'm just so grateful because I've heard the story, I've heard the stories that are opposite of that, of course, but no, Ricky, I had no idea. I had no idea. And then of course I, I start, I, you know, went to the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. I'm a graduate of Project Lead, but Dr. Melissa, you would be proud because I really wanted to understand the, you know, the science part of it because this is, you know, Dr. Moe and Dr. Melissa, you guys have been great because I understand it, like the ladder rungs and you know, the whole, it makes, cause it's just so, so much. I was never the science girl. <laughs> so hearing right. it in layman's terms makes it easy. Cause you know, it's intimidating. Like you're getting all this stuff and it's like, oh my God, all you know is like, all you hear is cancer, cancer, cancer. And it's like, oh my God. But yeah. no, I had no idea. Right. Dr. Melissa, we need to get some more people in the Davis lab with you. Like you need to be teaching some babies. You know, I would love to have some students. Let me tell you, it's hard to, um, it's hard to recruit here. Um, you know, I, you would think it's not, but you know, not, not everybody who comes to Cornell is interested in disparity, you know. Um, but I'm always open to, you know, volunteers. It's hard for me to say no, actually. I remember when I was at UGA, I used to um, have an army of undergraduates in my lab. And, all it took was for one of them to say, my aunt died of breast cancer. And I was like, okay, we'll find something for you to do, <laughs> you know, or, you know, any, any kind of personal connection, because I know those are the motivated learners, you know, they, they're there for a purpose, not just for extra credit or for a recommendation letter for med school, you know, they're actually invested. And We're so going to find some babies. We, we need babies to do you, both of you guys jobs, you know? We got to get these babies in school and learning and continuing all the work that you're doing and helping us because it's really I think the other thing much work to do. You know, is that we, um, we teach our kids that they only have one chance, right? At success. I know growing up because I didn't have a mom and I didn't have a dad. You thought we, we were taught that you got to be twice as good and work twice as hard and there's no room for failure. And I think I want us to learn to encourage our children a little bit differently about math and science because just because you don't necessarily perform well or you may struggle and it doesn't mean that it's not for you. 
and we sometimes will count ourselves out of these careers that we may really excel in because we need to study a different way because we need somebody to explain it a different way we need somebody to draw us a picture because we don't learn the same way as the person next to you and and i, I think that 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 ends up happening more often than we want to admit especially in science mathematics you know in, in medicine I, I can't tell you the number of people who said, oh, I wanted to be this and then I didn't do well in one class and I changed and I decided to do something different. And so if you're watching and you have young people who are interested in math and science, interested in medicine, you know, don't discourage them, even if they may struggle in it, support that struggle and figure out why and encourage your, your young people to go into these fields because representation matters. It matters so, 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 so much for research, for these conversations, for surgery. You know, I, we need more Dr. Davises here. We, we, we need an army of docs, you know? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I visited Meharry Medical School um, recently, like last fall before COVID. <laughs> and I, that was my first time really going back to a um, HBCU and seeing their graduate program oh my gosh it was beautiful i was i told them i'm so glad to see y'all because i'm getting tired and i need some backup. <laughs> i need some backup i'm so glad to see y'all are coming through you know keep coming but i have a secret so even though i have my phd in genetics and my career is based in genetics when i was an undergraduate genetics was my lowest scoring grade in my major like i'm i'm a Wow. Big a, a student, B student, I got a C in genetics. And so if I had taken that to heart and thought that, oh, a C in genetics means I'm not good in genetics, mm -hmm. you know, I, like, like you said, you know, classwork is one thing, but when you're being driven to discover something, the things you learn are tools that you should use to move forward and be a lifelong learner, right? When you're when you're in college, you know, what you learn in college is just the foundation of what we already know. Your goal should be to add more to that knowledge. So, mm -hmm. you know, just because you that. didn't do well or as good as, you know, oh my gosh, meet some cutoff or threshold, you know, that does not dictate your 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 I know that's right. I got diagnosed with a learning disorder as an adult. But you know, one of the things I, I learned from, from all of you and from my breasties especially is in my patients is that cancer is an opportunity to take this experience and make it transformative, you know, and make it count, make it mean something more than what it means. And, and Ricky, what I love about you is that every time I look at you and I see you, every time you do something, it's with the intent of taking something that happened to you and making it transformative for every single person around you. And, and that is, it's the same thing as, as with, you know, failure. We got to fail forward. The, the failure is an opportunity to learn and to transform and to change and to morph into something different, you know, and, and I, I want us to learn to look at it that way. But the lessons that you guys are sharing, you know, is, is so, um, it's so powerful because it's a metaphor for life, you know, like none of us can predict. We didn't cause this. You didn't right. do this to yourself. Your body didn't betray you. Right. But this right. thing happened. And now look what you're doing. Look how many people you're blessing as a result of That's it, right. you know, and that, that part is, is truly amazing to me. I agree. We have so much more work to do though, you guys. I feel like we're just like making a little rung in the ladder, you know, to use the ladder <laughs> analogy. So, <laughs> look to uh, you know, I think it's so important that we talk about it too. And, and we talk about it with our kids. It's never too early to talk about it with your kids. And, and you know, you know we, it's so funny. We're all doing all this ancestry.com work now. So do the health thing. When you're talking to your grandmother about what happened at Christmas, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. talk about who had a heart attack or who had diabetes, the sugar, whatever they call it. And <laughs> sugar, right. you know? family reunion t-shirt. Put the put the diseases on there. Hypertension, oh, wow, diabetes, like you know, I you like do your family that. tree. Put yeah. put some more information. Money. Right. Health and money. The right. two things we need to talk about the most in our communities. Yeah. And and even if it's not breast cancer, we all got something right whether it's hypertension or heart disease you know you know we're all you know all the black people are sticking with something right unfortunately right. so so you know let's all talk about everything and and so it becomes it becomes common to talk about it that it's okay that it's not to be feared it's not to be you right. know hidden it's to be it's okay you know and we then, then we can talk about prevention then right. we can talk can about we, nutrition everybody wants to skip to the nutrition and prevention part without understanding how these diseases happened in our bodies and why medicine sometimes is necessary. 
Right. And we all want to jump right to holistic medicine, but sometimes you need something right. stronger. Right. And it can right. all work together. It doesn't have to be either or. You know, that's another show we need to do, Ricky. Right. Real right. soon, we'll talk about holistic medicine and, right. and, and how it can partner with, um, with traditional and, and conventional and Western medicine, right. East meets right. West. Right. And then we also, you know, call it stress. complementary medicine. I think right. Yeah. right. Now, I don't like alternative. It's complementary, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 It's complementary. Right. But the stress of not talking about it is stressful. Yeah. Like, you know, it's more stressful to not talk about it and to hide it from your family. You know, put it out there and make it a learning experience for everybody, for the kids, for everybody. And, you know, you know, I'm a grandma now. I talk about everything with my three-year-old grandbaby. She probably won't remember half of it, but, but um, you know, she we have her said, no more breast cancer. Mm -hmm. but, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because I remember growing up, like we weren't allowed to be in those conversations when my, when my parents talked about health, you know. I remember vividly when my grandfather was sick, she, he, was, he was living with us and mama was taking care of him. And, you know, I remember her being so tired one night she couldn't even wake up he was calling her name and you know I was like okay well I gotta do it I was in high school and so the next morning I was like what is wrong with him like why won't you tell me what you know what what is his illness what is going on and she was like you know that's grown folks business and I'm like okay no. <laughs> you know if I I want to help Mm -hmm. I want to understand because right. I don't I hate understand. Folks, right? yeah. grown folks I used to hate that. Yeah. Hate that. <laughs> it's grown folks business. What All we knew was my mother died of something down there and nobody yeah. talked about it. You know, and it's a rare cancer, less than 1% of the population. And I didn't know till I was almost 29, you know, and, and we got to do better. We definitely do. That's one area where yeah. we can't, we can't let our pride get in the way of those things right. you know it's grown folks business because we know we don't have enough money because we know we don't have insurance because we know we can't you know we don't want to disclose our shame right right I didn't learn until right. I was older that what insurance we didn't have and how much we didn't have we just thought we were yeah you know, I thought we were okay right, right. and then you realize that we didn't talk about it because we were ashamed of it you know right I got one more question and then we got to go Latanya have you gene tested your nephew not yet, but we're planning to do that. That's a great question because we I talk about like he's very inquisitive and you know considering what happened to his dad, you know, and of course Londa, my sister's name was Yolanda, called her we called her Londa, but definitely planning to do that for sure. He's been actually bugging me about doing Ancestry.com, um, so of course we're going to do that. But I think, like you said, Doctor Melissa, that we should definitely um, or was it you, Doctor Mo? I'm sorry. And again, chemo brain. Can I ask a quick question about that? Dr. Melissa and Dr. Mo, like, what, what, what caused chemo brain? Because it is so real. Like, oh my God. Like, it's so real. I've had it so bad this week. Oh my God. Doc, you, you want to you wanna, uh, give it a go? or That's all you. That's all. All right. So, so chemo, chemo brain. Um, but first, let me go back to your nephew. Your nephew's 15, right? Yes. 15 is probably a little bit too young to be tested. The guidelines say probably um, a little bit older, maybe 18 uh, okay. is about a, a good age or so, um, depending on what the family history is, because it should be 10 years younger than the youngest person. So if the youngest person in the family was 17 with breast cancer, well, then, you know, you've got to test everybody early. Okay. Um, but to, to the chemo brain, so chemo damages the fastest growing cells in the body. It targets them specifically. So, um, and, and it can have residual uh, effects on the body, like numbness and tingling in your fingers. You know, you can get the neuropathy and it doesn't always go away, even though the drug is gone because it damages some of those nerves. So the effects on the brain, some of those drugs can cross the blood brain barrier and they can cause some um, some damage that should be reversible, but that can still result in some, uh, some forgetfulness, some fogginess. It can affect your metabolism and your ability to, um, to get rid of other cellular damage that makes you feel sluggish, that makes you feel forgetful. It can cause adrenal fatigue, right? So your adrenal glands can be worn down. That makes you feel sluggish, makes your metabolism slow, makes you feel kind of foggy. And, and so it's not a clear cut. That's a one thing that causes it but it is one of the known and lasting side effects of it. So um, there are ways to try to sharpen the brain function after chemo, ways to sort of detox from it. And so, you know, I tell my patients to really try to detox after their infusions, you know, things like lemon, ginger, cayenne, um, uh, clarifying types of herbs and, and drinks. 
um, because they can help to reverse some of the cellular damage and get your body to, to get rid of the damaged cells. Your body has to actually clean up. The Pac-Man's got to chop away at those, those damaged cells, and it takes a lot of work. So making sure that your vitamins are right, your magnesium, um, your, your calcium, your potassium, all those sorts of things, your minerals, you know, those trace little minerals are, are right in your body, come from your food, and it can help keep your brain sharp, increase in blood flow to your brain through things like ginkgo, ginkgo biloba. You know how you see some of those brain enhancing types of supplements? They right. increase blood flow to your brain. I need one. Yeah. So you get, you know, get some of those brain enhancing ones, not their blood thinners. Be careful if you're on a blood thinner or if you have a bleeding issue, but that's basically how they work is that they increase blood flow to your head so that you feel like, Oh, I have more oxygen. Oh, I think a little bit more clearly. Oh, I feel like, all right, I can understand this and tackle my day. So some of those might be helpful too. Okay. Thank you. 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 Our gosh, we got to go. We're late. But we're having so much fun. You guys yeah, are like this is great. such brainiacs. I can't. It's just I love this stuff. I'm so happy that you're here. Yeah, but I don't get to use this stuff. I have a master's in molecular biology, and I don't <laughs> use it nearly as much as I want to. So thank you, Dr. Davis. You're thank you, Dr. Davis. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Thank you for for joining us and yes. sharing your story. Yeah. yeah. So much, Davis. So how do people reach you, Dr. Melissa? Um. So I. I'm on Twitter. Um, my handle is Melly, M-E-L-I-D 32. Um, I'm on Facebook, same thing, Melly D 32. I can send you information too. I, I might just put it in the chat. In the chat. We'll put it in the chat. chat. Yeah, yeah. In the chat. yeah, that'd be great. And, and that's just the comments under the live feed on, on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. On the Facebook page, you put in there. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, great. no problem. Great. I'm so, I'm, it, this has been so wonderful to just be with my people. <laughs> <laughs> we love you. <laughs> Come back anytime. Come back anytime to perform this. Yes. Okay. And Latanya, my breastie, tell us about your show real quick. Oh, my gosh. So my sister's birthday is next Tuesday, the 29th. So I'm launching the trailer for the Breast Talk Ever, it is amazing. The first episode debuts on October 6th. So I promise you guys, it's, it's gonna be informative. And I think both of you, Dr. Mo and Dr. Melissa, my sorrow, you will be very, you'll be very pleased. Cool. Good, good. Thank you, for, thank you, Ricky good. and Dr. Mo for having me. Yeah, so how do you, how do we find your podcast? Um, it's actually going to be, of course, the usual suspects, Apple, Spotify, wherever they get their uh, podcast, you'll be able to subscribe starting next Tuesday. Okay, so we'll post it on our yes. Facebook page, okay? Okay. Give me okay. Something close, okay? And then yes. I'll go say goodbye, and then you say, because that's why I got to one more thing. So I'm wearing orange today because um, we're going to do a Halloween dog walk on Halloween, October 31st. Walk your dog, let your dog wear a costume. We'll put more stuff on our social media, but um, we'll give, we're gonna give prizes for costumes and talk about bone health and the importance of walking. So look for the, all the information on our website and on our Facebook page and our Instagram and, and sign up and walk with us. That's gonna be the first of our walks. Then we have another walk that I won't even talk about yet, but, but you guys know how to find me at Ricky Dove, at Touch BBCA. We're here for you, call us, text us, email us, and we love you and thanks for watching. Yep, I'm Dr. Thank Monique you. Gary on the Instagram, the Facebook, the LinkedIn, the Twitter, got a new YouTube, <laughs> good night. Um, and, and if you need anything, you know, questions, consults, connections, Ricky knows, we'll find you a doctor in your area. We will explain well, what we wonderful. can to you and connect you with research, with trials, with support services. Wonderful. Um, this is what we do here. You know, it's up to us, like you said, Dr. Melissa, to repair the relationship between right. our community and scientists and physicians, right. clinicians. Like we have to be the bridge. So thank you for joining us. The doctor thank is in. Um, yeah. We'll try to answer the questions in the chat, you guys. I know I need you guys to help me answer those questions in the chat. Yeah. But okay. we'll see you guys. Thank you. Breasty love. Oh, Breasty okay. love. The doctor is in. See you next week. Next week. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Thank you. Fucking